<clears throat> well, good afternoon, everybody, um, <clears throat> and welcome to the public board meeting of the Care Quality Commission uh, on the 19th of July. Uh, obviously, this is a slightly later and shorter meeting than usual. Just to clarify, this is not intention of a one-off shift. It just reflected uh, the uh, <clears throat> availability of people and the uh, extent of topics we had to discuss at the public meeting today. But I would expect that going forward, we'll revert to the more normal uh, starting early afternoon and perhaps a slightly longer agenda. Um, <clears throat> a number of administrative uh, observations to make uh, in no particular order. Uh, firstly, though, uh, delighted to welcome, uh, we've had appointed to the board, uh, three new non-executive directors. Um, <clears throat> you should, if you're watching on the screen, be able to see, but Christine Asbury and the strike top sitting opposite me, uh, David Corsdale Lappleby over there, and uh, Dr. Mark Chakravarti also joined us. However, that leads me on to apologies. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Chakravarti can't join us today. Obviously, he was only appointed a few weeks ago. He had another board meeting in his diary for today, which he'd already committed to, so he can't join us. Um, but uh, he is available for all future meetings, so it's a one-off. Uh, and then <clears throat> one of our continuing non-executives, uh, Belinda Black, is also unfortunately unable to join us today through uh, combination of family circumstances. Um, I also have a uh, semi-apology for uh, Tyson Heppel, who uh, has a, a minor injury and was having to stay at home. Uh, we're expecting him to join us by video, but we seem to be having some technical problems, So, uh, which is the reason we've actually started this slightly later than on the program. We were trying to connect him and can't. So hopefully he'll join us, but if not, I'll ask other colleagues to pick up the areas that he would have covered. Uh, and last, but by no means least, um, can I welcome uh, James Bullion sitting over there. Uh, James is a new appointment <coughs> um, as, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Chief Inspector of Adult Social Care uh, and Integration. So welcome, uh, James. Um, <coughs> uh, and I think finally, um, we, as regular watchers will know, we always have uh, somebody from our Disability Qualities Network. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Gillian Marsden, who's here with us today. Welcome, Gillian. Um, do we have any new declarations or new declarations of interest from anybody here? No, thank you very much. Uh, and any urgent business that people want to put on the agenda that we don't already have? It looks like not. Thank you very much indeed. So um, perhaps we could just move straight on to the um, <coughs> reporting. Ian, I don't know if you want to kick off, and we'll pick up with your colleagues as necessary. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Uh, I've got two reports. One is the regulatory report. One is the operational report and the organizational report. So I'll, I'll run through both of those uh, relatively quickly uh, together, and then we'll, we can pick up questions at the end of that. Uh, firstly, uh, the National Maternity Programme. This is a programme of work we've been doing to uh, run inspections across uh, the whole of, of maternity services across the whole country. Um, and it's designed to do two things. One is to give us a, an up-to-date picture of what's going on uh, in, in each, of the, uh, each of the individual services, but also probably more importantly, to capture good practice. Um, and it's really important to us that we can both look at what's going on positively and negatively, but also the, capturing the good practice and then play that back to the sector through a series of reports uh, and, and a series of other products. So for example, Carolyn Jenkinson, one of our colleagues, has written a, a blog recently which covers uh, some of the, the things that we have seen. Um, the second, second item I wanted to draw attention to was urgent and emergency care. Uh, we're continuing to look at high-risk services, uh, examining pathways, uh, because what we recognise is people's experience of care is as much to do with the way they transit between services in an area as it is about the service that they receive from an individual service. So again, we're doing some work uh, in the east of England uh, on, in that area as we're starting to think ahead to this coming winter and how we can we can be uh, as supportive as possible uh, as a regulator to the to providers as they move into what will inevitably be another a very challenging time period. Uh, local area, uh, local, sorry, local authority assurance and integrated care systems. Our pilot work uh, in those two really important new areas continues. Uh, and I'm going to ask James in a second just to, just to talk about in detail about the um, the, the detail of, of where we are with that. But the pilot work is is going well, and we're having some some good 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 uh, constructive conversations with colleagues at the Department of Health and Social Care. 
Um, we've listed out on in the report some really important uh, reports that are coming up. Uh, one is the Defence Medical Services Annual Report. As, as many of you know, we support uh, our, the Defence Medical Services uh, in their regulatory role. Um, carrying out regulatory activity on their behalf, uh, looking at the quality of care that's delivered to uh, people in our armed forces. Um, we've all, we're also issuing uh, reports on safer management of controlled drugs, um, as well as uh, the urgent publishing the Urgent and Emergency Care, care Survey from 2022 at the end of July. That's a survey that we carry out on behalf of, of the NHS. Um, in terms of organisational matters, um, the overall uh, op operational performance continues uh, to be strong. Uh, I would like to take the opportunity to publicly thank uh, our colleagues and, and Tyson Heppel and his team uh, for the efforts that they've been making uh, over a number of months now to, to engage in training activity for the, go, the significant go live that we had with our new uh, future regulatory platform. The regulatory platform uh, is our new, new system that replaces our, our, our customer relationship management system. It's the culmination of, of a couple of years' work within our transformation program. And although from an external point of view, it won't have an obvious, um, an obvious impact, internally it, it is a much more consistent, reliable way of looking at inquiries and making sure that we can, do, we can deal with them in, in the most effective way, and also to report on them and play some of those inquiries back to, to, to providers. That's a build on a go live that we had earlier on in June, where we opened up our provider portal, and it's now possible for providers to cancel their registration online. And again, there are a series of go lives now uh, as, we, as the portal uh, opens up between now and the latter part of this year. Our next major go live, uh, which uh, people will be interested in, will be towards the end of, uh, of October into November as we, as we start with our new uh, single assessment framework. But I think the big, the big uh, important news internally is, is that um, colleagues have managed to keep up good operational performance whilst engaging in training activity as well. Um, and initial reports are that that has gone well uh, and we're, we're confident that, 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 uh, that we can continue on track with our transformation programme in the latter part of this year. Um, I'd just like to note that there's a, a fair amount of parliamentary engagement which is, which is noted in the report uh, as well. I'm going to ask James just briefly just to come in on ICS's and local authority assurance and then open up for questions. Thanks, Ian. Yes, thank you and good afternoon. I'm really uh, delighted and proud to have joined uh, uh, CQC in this role. Um, so in, in terms of both of the uh, new programmes, the local authority assessments have begun. It's a really uh, good moment to, as it were, uh, note that we're now into the work in detail. We're working with five pilot areas, so um, work has already commenced in Lincolnshire and uh, now in Birmingham, and then we'll be moving on to North Lincolnshire and uh, Nottingham uh, City and Suffolk. Um, we had been in the run-up to operating these two pilots collecting some national data uh, around access and around care services, and we're now road testing the full uh, uh, the full framework, full quality framework, um, with the five uh, pilot areas, um, and um, we'll be issuing a, a report and an indicative rating for those um, local authorities who are taking part in the pilots. We're grateful for those uh, LAs taking part in the process with us, um, but I can I can report from uh, dipping into the program that it does feel very real for those local authorities. They are participating and and uh, taking this very seriously and uh, we can see evidence beyond the five pilot areas of preparation across all local authorities actually limbering up and getting themselves familiar with the assessment framework and um, getting their information ready to, to share with us. Once we've completed the pilots um, we will be uh, reporting on that and confirming as it were our final methodology for assessments before rolling those assessments out to uh, a, a group of um, wider councils um, in the in the new year. And um, on the integrated care systems, uh, similarly, we, we've uh, shared our initial methodology and we've, we're now in a position where we can confirm that we are piloting um, this assessment process with Birmingham and Solihull ICB um, and with Dorset ICB. And it's good uh, actually to have an overlap between the local authority assurance uh, assessment and the integrated care um, uh, system assessment in, in the form of Birmingham and Solihull. Um, and in these assessments, we're looking at um, 
quality and safety, we'll be looking at leadership, we'll be looking at integration uh, arrangements, particularly focused on what are the outcomes uh, for people in, in those areas and how our, how our relationships are working. Again, um, we will be uh, piloting um, um, uh, aspects of our framework and eventually um, moving from the pilots into assessments in, and that will be in the spring of uh, next year for um, ICSs. We anticipate probably takes about eight weeks to do um, an LA assurance and about 10 to 12 weeks to do an ICB. So it's not just a question of when boots are on the ground in field work, actually we're engaging with um, all of the, um, we're engaging with all local forces and all ICSs as it were, to gather data in addition to the field work week as it were with them. So very pleased to have begun. We're, we're in the learning phase though uh, as, a, as a commission um, uh, before, we, before we roll out uh, in earnest. Thank you. So over to colleagues, any questions or comments? Okay, well, I, I um, Mark. Uh, Mark, I beg your pardon. Um, yeah, it was just an, an update from Ian, if we could, on the, on the discussions around pay, so it would also be helpful to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, yes, we've been having some some very constructive uh, conversations with our trades union colleagues on the on the topic of, of pay. As you recall, the we are subject to the civil service pay remit, and this year the civil service pay remit had two components to it. One component was around a salary increase. Another component was around a one-off uh, non-consolidated payment of £1,500. Uh, so we've confirmed to trade union colleagues that, that we will be paying the one-off uh, £1,500 uh, payment uh, to all full-time employees who were employed with us between uh, the 31st of March uh, and the 1st of, of August, and we'll be pro rastering that payment uh, based on, on for, for, for part-time uh, workers. Our trade union colleagues, of course, are, are, are very supportive of making that payment, but we haven't been able to reach agreement around some of the detailed eligibility uh, criteria. They, in particular, would like all uh, all employees to receive the £1,500, regardless of, the, of whether they work full or part-time, and, and they'd also so like like us to change the eligibility date as well um, that's not something that I, I think we can we can do it's, it would fall outside the the pay remit so they are supportive of the, of making the payment uh, but recognize that we've had to we, we've, we've had to uh, to make the payment without their explicit agreement uh, however as that said I think I think we understand each other's point of view on this um, and I think we've been there's been a, there's, I say been constructive conversations and we're now uh, talking to them about uh, the salary increase for for the for the 23 24 uh, pay year uh, as you, again as you know we we pay our salary increase on the 1st of September each year rather than the 1st of, of April um, so in line with the civil service pay remit that that's the basis on which we're, we're having our, our conversations um, we're both very clear there's a real shared ambition I think though to make sure that we can conclude those discussions in time for the 1st of September so that we can make sure that our, our colleagues have the salary uplift uh, in uh, in the September pay, which is on the 19th of September. So, I think bringing those two things together um, is 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 really important, and I think I think we, we are moving in in the right direction. Uh, a number of the, the unions who who had uh, talked to us about strike action have withdrawn the, the, those strike action notifications. So again, that's a a very positive development. I think it is worth saying, though, uh, the the obvious point that that uh, as a salary increase and a one-off payment of this of this magnitude does represent a financial challenge for us as an organisation. The fifteen hundred pounds um, payment on its own is about is, is about a five million pound cost, which obviously we and and all the other organisations in, in in the public service were not budgeting for. So again, that's something that we need to be on top of uh, over the course of the remainder of the, of this year. Um, but as I say, I, th I think the, the general direction of travel is a positive one, and I'm, I, I am very optimistic we'll be able to deliver a, a good uh, pay increase for colleagues uh, in, the, in the September salary. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Actually, just picking up on a couple of things, I mean, look, thanks for the, the update. Uh, <clears throat> just getting back a bit, I think it's worth mentioning that the NEDs obviously have been consulted at a high level on this. I think the overall objective was to get money in people's pockets as quickly as possible. So. Thank you for doing that. Um, 
the you did mention this point about prorating pay. Um, I understood from talking to some of my colleagues elsewhere that prorating for part time was the normal practice. So what we've done is is in line with others. Um, perhaps you could just confirm that or not. Okay. Uh, I can. I can. Uh, the the civil service pay remit is is quite clear. It says it says you should use the policy that that you normally do for these for these for these processes. Uh, our normal practice is to prorate. Uh, one of the reasons that we've been uh, debating this for a, a few weeks with uh, with the uh, other arms length bodies within the Department of Health and Social Care family is we've been having exactly this conversation, and I'm confident that we are entirely consistent with the uh, with, with the activities of other ALBs in the DHSE family and indeed the DHSE themselves. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or comments for Ian or colleagues? I mean, I, I, I had an observation and a, a question just to build on what James said uh, for the benefit of, of other board colleagues, but um, I attended a big chunk of the Local Government Association meeting a couple of weeks ago. Um, Ian and a number of, of, of his team were there. Uh, one of our wonderful team was, was presenting. Um, <clears throat> it was quite obvious that, I mean, it was a huge event and a lot of big agendas, I don't want this to be overstated, nevertheless, it is quite clear that our work in this area uh, has carries a lot of significance to people, there are a number of, of dedicated sessions. Certainly the feedback I got talking to people was, yes, it's important, but I was getting some very positive feedback about the way we've got about uh, putting the assessments in place and the way we've worked with other people. So um, and I suppose I'd like to thank Jim, well, the team have inherited James in due respect rather than you, but thank the team for doing that. I mean, obviously, it's easier to agree with the process before you've seen the outcomes, um, and it may be inevitable that some people won't necessarily like the assessments we come to, but it seems to me it's a heck of a good start that if people um, at least think we've gone that extra mile to get the right process and allowed people to uh, have input to it, then the outputs um, ought to carry a greater um, respect from people who receive them. So I just thought I'd add that, but thanks to the team, James. Uh, my question actually is a detailed one, but in um, Ian, your report, you know, the ICSs, there's a statement right at the end that DHSE have yet to decide on ICS is being rated. I don't know if you could just expand a little bit more on that, or maybe that's one for James. One for James. Yes, yeah, certainly. So we've had, um, we've, we've built our assessment uh, methodology on uh, uh, on the basis that we have the capability to to uh, rate um, built in. Um, however, we we uh, since since doing that work, we've had the Hewitt review, which has taken a look at at this issue and has reported um, and made some um, re recommendations to the department. And the department have responded. They would like us to look at sector based uh, ratings as part of our work. So we had, we had not particularly planned for that particular uh, flavour of rating in the work that we're going to do. So we're taking that into the pilot process and, and uh, looking to see what that means and what's, uh, what's feasible. So we're building up options now which we'll report back to uh, the department. But we've got the capability uh, because of our methodology to, to issue a report and um, certainly a narrative and potentially a, a rating for the whole systems, but it is not finalised yet. And, and um, I appreciate this isn't within our control, but have you any indication of likely timelines for this? I think there's still more to emerge on that too, but certainly we are timely enough to be looking at this in, t in the pilot process. Okay, thanks. So if there's no more questions, we should also thank um, me and your colleagues for the recent, recent successful delivery of, of some of the systems so far. So thanks back to Mark, you and your team should formally note that. Um, <clears throat> if there's no more questions on the uh, operational performance, let's move on to the research program and your report. Um, <clears throat> Sean, I think you're going to lead off on this. Uh, Julian may be joining. Um, so um, you might, for the benefit of people, just give a little of the background or context on why we're doing this and then give us an update. We have your paper, of course, but thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And um, yes, Julian and Zoe, I think, will be presenting the report 
Um, this is the first uh, research program uh, annual report, which I think uh, is, 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 is a very exciting moment for CQC. I think the research program demonstrates the commitment uh, of the CQC to being um, an evidence-led and um, learning organization. And I think uh, the, the, the report itself um, demonstrates how our research is aligned uh, to our strategic priorities, for example, safety through learning, uh, reduction of inequalities. It also demonstrates how we've worked uh, in collaboration with <coughs> research partner organizations and some of the leading academics within them. Um, and also gives a, gives a flavor of the breadth of, of research that we've engaged with in the first year and how much has been achieved in the first year. So I'll, I'll let um, Zoe and, uh, and Gillian uh, take us through the report. Okay. I was going to say, could you? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, if I, I'm one of the... Have you, you need to put your... No, can you switch? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm Zoe Fife. I'm one of the heads of strategy and the research and evaluation program falls within um, my remit. But Gillian, who's been, I know, joining you all day today, is going to lead presenting it, and then I might add a few things at the end. Thanks, Zoe. Um, so, yeah, I think, as, as Sean was saying, uh, this, the research programme is designed to support our strategy, and it's about us making sure that we have the right evidence base to deliver our strategy well. Um, and therefore, all of the research that we've done and in the way that we've designed the research programme, um, we've been thinking about the practical application of that research all the way through. So how are we going to use this to inform our single assessment framework um, and to inform our independent voice in particular? Um, I think um, in terms of what we've done in the first year, we wanted to ensure that we started with what was already known um, what we kind of when we looked at the questions that we wanted to answer we recognized that there was evidence available out there in the in the system but that evidence was quite disparate um, and it was quite poorly connected um, to what we do so what we've done is kind of a series of literature reviews that have been really designed to make it tangible and applicable to our context so that we can use the evidence um, for our work um, so far, we have completed seven uh, research projects, and the priority now, as well as obviously to deliver more research on areas that we need to know more about, is really to ensure that, that the research that we have done has an impact, as Sean was saying. Um, I think that, that it's about things like the specific implications for kind of what the evidence that we use against that single assessment framework, um, things around kind of how we use the research to inform training and development for our own colleagues, so for particularly, for example, on um, a safety learning curriculum for our colleagues, um, and also how we're going to use that research, the research to inform our improvement campaigns so that we're kind of um, delivering our ambitions to accelerate improvement. Um, I think one of the advantages of the research program is that it allows us to be adaptable to the external environment and ensure that we're kind of knowing what what's out there and we are being kind of therefore kind of dynamic and effective in our approach um i think that as again sean said we've um we've really kind of tried to do this in partnership with others we want to collaborate on research we don't think that we're the best place to do everything also we don't want that we think we're the best place to fund everything so we've been looking at how we work with others and i think that we've started to signal in the work that we've done in the first year that we are in this space and that we want to collaborate with others and i think that by doing that we also increase potential kind of impact and influence of the research we do and hopefully improve the um, impact of our regulation as well um i think that that's all i wanted to say i don't know if so there's anything you wanted to add um, I'll just add um, a couple of points. One of the things um, Gillian mentioned is really building our work with partners. There's something we need to do in that and that we're working on as well about how to make sure that we are a good research partner. Um, we've uh, got lots of people really interested in working with us. There's some logistical and practical things like making sure we've got the right procurement frameworks, the right access to all the right sort of partners and that we can work with them well um, and that we can attract really high quality researchers, academics, um, people from various fields. Um, to work with us to make sure that we're really doing things that have impact and are meaningful for us. Um, and then also just to mention, we spoke to um, some colleagues a few months ago um, 
about where we were up to with this. And we said at that time that we were expecting quite a lot of projects to complete over um, over this summer. That is happening. We are pleased to update that, that's, that we are seeing that coming through. Um, I'm in a workshop all day today, just kind of across the hall, uh, reflecting on the improvement cultures research and thinking about how not only can we use that to think about how we look for improvement cultures um, in providers and in systems, but also to think about ourselves. How are we... Um, how are we using that research to make sure that we are an improving and a learning organisation? Um, so I think from that conversation in, I think it was May, um, continuing as planned. Um, sorry, I should just add, um, just a very, it's a, it's a kind of procedural note, but the, the version of the um, report that was shared with the board has a very slight amendment to what was published. Um, that was just the inclusion of a fi an another research project that we, we were getting funding for from NH NIHR and we needed DHSE approval and that came after board circulation of papers. So just to note that that's a slight amendment. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Julian uh, and Zoe. Questions or comments from my colleagues? Christine. Thank, um, thank you. <coughs> um, I, I found this really helpful report, actually, um, and I, I thought the focus and priorities were, were spot on. But my interest really, um, I'd like to understand a bit more, is about how the, the impact of that and the dissemination of it, how will that dissemination how will that disseminate down to teams and how soon is that going to happen? Is it going to be a very sort of slow and long process um, or is it going to be something that has impact within months? Um, you'll be pleased to hear it's already happening. Um, so we've been having seminars and workshops with our colleagues. We're working with um, Chris um, Day's team um, on further dissemination um, and we're trying to think about you know, it's not just about putting out information, but actually engaging our colleagues in conversations so that they understand kind of the applicability to them and that we make it relevant to their context. So we, we, we've already started that work, but absolutely um, we'll continue to do it. And just, just a supplementary on that is how will you analyse that impact? Um, it's a very good question. Um, I think that there's kind of some kind of hard and soft kind of elements to that. We have formal recommendations which are kind of working their way through and we're going to measure and kind of look at kind of the implementation of each of those recommendations. So <coughs> how exactly we measure it will kind of be dependent on the individual recommendations, but we are kind of ap actively thinking about measuring so that we certainly in future annual reports will be reporting not just on what research we found, but what difference that that research has made. So absolutely um, hopefully as you would hope to expect from um, research and evaluation colleagues we're, we're very much thinking about that if I could just add to that sorry there's also something around um, one of the things that the team does is really build a, a network of people interested um, in research and evaluation and kind of have things like an internal site that allows people to access some of this easily um, kind of support um, conversations about research and evidence they're the things that are a bit harder to, tra to track but I think are really important in getting us to have the right culture that we're that we're um, uh, so that we're really using this. Um, so yeah, more difficult to track, but we're focusing on that too. Thanks very much. I think it was Steve and Anne David. Let's take them in that order. Sorry, Gillian. Thank you very much indeed. Really helpful paper and a very interesting uh, program you've got. Um, Ian mentioned in presenting his report that the uh, the CQC has has released just this week. Uh, sort of the. Um, the new approach to collecting data, which over time will build a huge, complex, powerful data set. Is it part of our own research program to be thinking about, well, how, how do we best make use of that to, to start answering some interesting research questions? And might there be an, uh, a, a case for a call out to the academic community to say, this, this, is, what we, this is what we've now got, who out there would be interested in working with us to to analyse what it's telling us? Um, yeah, so I think, again, it is a really... Um, I don't think we've got a full answer to that question yet, but I think we're developing that answer. I think that we... Um, we absolutely want to, again, I think you, you, you can hit the nail on the, kind of the head there, that we don't want to be just thinking, how do we answer all of these questions? What we want to do is develop kind of stronger relationships with the academic community so that they know what questions we're interested in. We are already having 
larger and larger number of kind of meetings and workshops with different academic groups to kind of share our questions our, our, the areas of our research interest are on our website and we're we're kind of directing people to that so that we're trying to communicate <coughs> what we're interested in finding out so that actually we're encouraging kind of discussion and and, and, and investigation of questions that we're interested in as well as obviously proactively trying to answer some of them as well. Uh, and just to add to that, I think ultimately the answer to your questions is yes, um, we absolutely need to do those things. We've, um, we've started them, there's further to go, but certainly the new um, approaches we have to collecting information put us in a much stronger position to do that than we were historically. Um, we know that our historic data is very difficult to use, um, but actually we're now, we've got the foundations of something that really could support this having much more power in the future. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for the report. Um, I was just aware when you were talking, uh, talking about the headlines of this, that there is a lot of information at the moment coming out from UK R&I, from the research councils, from Innovate, and from Research England, that it is indicating the new approach that's being taken. This was all developed when we were still in the negotiations over Horizon Europe, as you're probably aware. The other source of information that's coming out is the guidance for the next REF, which talks a lot about how impact, of course, how knowledge exchange and how sustainability are going to be looked at. Um, I would recommend, if you haven't done so already, uh, that you, you take a look at that, because I think that will give you a very modern perspective on how we might develop our research program over the next two, three years. Thank you. Uh, brilliant. Will do. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I, I just had an observation of one very simple question. Um, <clears throat> I mean, firstly, I think just, just a compliment to the approach. I mean, there is not a lack of research on the health and care systems. So, uh, it was easy to say that we needed to do something, but I think um, the approach we've adopted of seeing what others have already done, it's an obvious step, but often missed, I have to say. Uh, so the, the logic that said, let's look at that and then work with others for a whole bunch of reasons, not less co-funding, I think it, it's to be commended. So uh, coming into this organization a year or so ago, I was quite impressed to see us doing that way, so well done. Um, just a very simple question. Um, <clears throat> I mean, this is uh, looked at through our eyes as to what we're going to do, and I take it from that that we are approaching others to help put this together. That to what extent are we becoming a sort of convener of things and maybe people approaching us or not? Um, I think we absolutely are. Um, so I think there's two kind of parts to that answer. Um, first of all, in terms of developing the questions that we're seeking to answer, we have we haven't just looked at that from an internal perspective we held workshops where we kind of convened external co colleagues to kind of actually help frame and shape those questions in a way that would be most useful with the external evidence so that not only was it and also not to make sure that it was not only useful for us but that the research would have maximum impact by being useful for others as well um, and then the other thing is that we are increasingly, I mean, it's, we are, it's, it's increasing exponentially, actually, as people start to understand that we're in this space. Um, they're coming to us and they're saying, let's, you know, how do we work with you? And we are then kind of trying to, we are now starting to be able to join up kind of different people who are interested in the same kind of research areas and I think that that will continue to grow. I think that we've got a level of maturity in terms of exactly how we make that happen in a kind of um, smooth way, but absolutely the appetite is there, and I think we're, we're starting to um, kind of build those relationships and kind of act on them as well. I think that, um, and that applies with kind of some of the, um, the obvious partners, things like academics. We've also had conversations with um, kind of our equivalent bodies in, in Europe and elsewhere um, about potentially shared research questions or places where we've got really shared interests where actually some of the findings would actually apply to us all um, and perhaps we're at risk of uh, everyone doing everything in silos or we could really join up as well. Chris, you want a word? Just one example of, of that that's happened this week. So um, some of the information, so Gillian's is absolutely right, part of the, 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 the rationale for this was to demonstrate to a wider group of organisations and people that we were interested in this, in this work. 
Um, we, we, this week we held an innovation uh, seminar, I think it was a couple of days ago, my, my uh, geography of uh, time is uh, 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 missing, but um, what that began to do is to say, well, what data information do we hold that actually might be useful, not just to academics, but actually to business partners and those seeking to provide new and innovative solutions into health and care. So I think there are, there are a number of different avenues that we can explore with this, and I think it's really it's great that we can we've, we've corral that information in a new way, and it will lead to new academic partnerships. It will lead to partnerships with organisations, but I think it will also lead to uh, driving innovation and improvements in the wider health and social, social care system from what we know, and that's an important uh, outcome as well. Good point. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, thank you very much indeed. It was down for noting or discussion. Not that we don't need to approve it per se, but I think you can take away from the discussion kind of big approval for the approach. So thanks for doing it uh, with a couple of suggestions, in particular David's comments. So, sorry, thank you for joining us. Um, <clears throat> so that brings us on to um, the quarterly assurance report. Um, Kate, I'll hand over to you. Um, you might clarify, Jackie was supposed to be here, I gather couldn't be here. So uh, you can explain how we're handling that as well. Okay, um, good afternoon, uh, colleagues. So I'm here today to share with you our quarterly um, people update. Um, it's got a different format to uh, the people updates you've received before. Um, and our goal with this update is to kind of bring together the stats. So what do vacancy rates look like? What are turnover rates? Why are people leaving? Um, along with some programs of activity that we're quite proud of. So looking forward to talking to you briefly about our inclusive leadership um, program, as well as trying to bring out a bit of sentiment as well. So you'll, you'll notice in, in the pack, and I hope to do more of this depending on feedback, that kind of blend of what do the numbers tell us, but also some quotes from people uh, receiving um, the kind of services and, and programs that we've got underway um, at the moment. So, so at the end, happy to take questions, but also would really welcome feedback from you all about is this the sort of format and content that you are expecting for these um, updates. So very briefly going to start on talking about recruitment. There's a huge amount of recruitment activity happening in the business um, at the moment. Um, we've got real ambitions to have a really inclusive and effective way of recruiting uh, people into um, into CQC. You'll remember from our listening, learning and responding to concerns review, there was work to be done around reasonable adjustments and there's been some really good progress on that. Um, I think it's really positive our work around our independent panel members. So you'll note in the pack that 100% of uh, recruitment uh, interview panels where we're recruiting at the exec grade or grade A's, which is for our managers, have an in independent panel member sat on that recruitment panel. And you may remember Blessing, um, who was our network rep in the last board, asked me what our plans were to expand that pool of IPMs, independent panel members, and that is something we are planning on doing um, as well. But we recently held a recruitment um, work workshop with colleagues from the People Directorate and those from um, our networks to look at what more can we do. So currently our recruitment process uh, end, ultimately ends up with a kind of panel recruitment where people are asked questions on the spot and are expected to answer unless they've got reasonable adjustments and we've done something different for that. Um, what is the best practice internationally when it comes to getting the maximum amount of people when we interview them and what might a different approach look like? So that work is um, underway at the moment and we look forward to talking to board about what the outputs of that um, look like as well. Um, again, you'll notice in the pack we've got a slightly higher turnover rate than um, than we usually have. Um, and I think um, if you look at the turnover rates and you look at the kind of organisational changes we're going through at the moment within... Um, uh, within operations um, that might be to be expected. Um, however, we hope to see those turnover rates come down. Again, when you look at your um, pack, your information pack, we do exit interviews with colleagues, colleagues leaving the organisation. And if you look at the word cloud, and um, the, the largest word is that people are leaving because of career progression, which is fantastic. The second largest word is around higher salaries and benefits. And um, Ian's already talked to you today about um, uh, what, where we, uh, where we are on the on the pay pay. For as well. Um, very briefly on diversity and inclusion, we are seeing an increase in colleagues reporting uh, whether they have a disability or they're from an ethnic um, background. We have more work to do to close the gap on that, so we are about 4.7 underrepresented on uh, colleagues with disabilities when we look at um, the wider employment market and less than 1% for colleagues from an ethnic uh, minority. 
Diversity and inclusion uh, was a focus of our recent Pulse survey. So we undertook a Pulse survey in the organisation through May, had great uh, engagement as we always do with our Pulse survey, so 74% of our colleagues responded. There was a real focus on um, uh, disability um, inequalities um, that came out of that survey. That will inform our workforce uh, race equality uh, standards and our workforce disability equality um, uh, plans that board will be seeing later in um, autumn. Um, and we will look forward to sharing with board the full findings from the poll survey in September once uh, the exec team have had a chance to di fully digest them and to share them with our, our networks to get those kind of insights we need um, ahead of that. Um, uh, just a few few final points around um, culture. So we've been doing workshops in our operational uh, part of the business around good endings and good, good beginnings. There have been three modules. We have recently evaluated the first module and 96% of colleagues who went on that module reported being satisfied or very satisfied with the training and there were clear objectives within that training around supporting leaders to feel confident with changes around transformation and how to support colleagues um, going through changes as well. Um, and then two other things, we've got our new inclusive leadership pathway that has launched recently. Um, a programme that we uh, feel really positive about. I'm on it and I'm working with a, a colleague in the organisation as well. And this is about uh, working with um, colleagues from ethnic minority backgrounds and colleagues who are disabled, who have ambitions to progress within the organisation. And the vision of the programme is they are matched up with someone more senior to help kind of dispel the myth of what these more senior roles look like, um, to invite them into forums where they might be wouldn't be in before, so observing an exec meeting, uh, for example, um, and to help uh, support them uh, gain those uh, promotion activities, uh, pr promotion opportunities. And you'll see in the report, so 30, 49 colleagues started out on the programme. Um, so far, seven have got promotions. And again, you've got a, a couple of quotes in there about people's experiences of being on the programme. As ever, we'll evaluate that, but that feels like something we might want to do more of uh, going forward. Um, and then lastly, um, uh, the reverse mentoring. So you might remember Belinda Black, our colleague, our Ned colleague who's not here today, asked at a couple of board meetings ago where did that program get to we did it a couple of years ago and that's where senior members of the organization are matched up are mentored by uh, colleagues from um, uh, ethnic minority backgrounds to gain insight and to increase learning around um, race um, we did the first program we evaluated it um, and, and there was learning from that first program that we uh, needed to digest before moving into our next um, uh, episode of that and we were looking we're looking forward to launching that in um, autumn and the very final thing is is uh, we're pulling together a people handbook. Um, so you may be aware we have lots of policies in the organisation. Um, you'll remember in the listening, learning and responding to concerns review that there is a need to place people at the centre rather than process. And I think we all agree our policies can be could be more accessible and more people-centric rather than process-centric. So um, work is well underway with that people handbook. Um, when it's in a good enough draft, it will be shared with the networks to sense check around accessibility. Have we got all the information you need in one place to help you do uh, your job? Um, and again, uh, we will come back to board in due course with that. Um, so that's just a bit of a flavour of what's in your pack. Really happy to take questions um, from colleagues. Thanks, Kate, and very well done handing that without any support. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll take questions just a second, but just to be clear, uh, I mean, there's a big update on things, but uh, really there's two things we need to address. One is any questions on the detail, we'll take those, uh, but also the executive asking for uh, guidance on whether the pack in front of you now responds to the questions posed. It would be nice to answer that. Um, we can take detailed drafting offline, but if there's any general gaps in what's here can we kind of identify them at at this stage and you also posed the question on frequency um i might turn that around slightly and say what do you think's uh, appropriate uh, although maybe i should half answer my own question and say you know <coughs> every every meeting sounds an awful lot quarterly doesn't work for six meetings a year so six monthly i guess looks like a an obvious thing um but you may wish to add when we finish some questions whether that's right and colleagues sort of agree um so there are two broad areas, but I don't think we have to take them one by one, just take any questions or observations. Uh, Mark, it looked like you wanted to add before we go any further. 
Uh, thank you. <clears throat> um, I, I think fantastic. I love the renewed report. I, I just wanted to say, uh, second your comments about the inclusive leadership pathway, which I, I'm, I'm one of the sponsors on that pathway. I think you know it's absolutely fantastic opportunity, um, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a really great program that we're running for disabled colleagues and, and colleagues from an ethnic minority. Um, I also wanted to kind of bring out um, the the networks that we that we have in CQC. I think um, they contribute to. Uh, a huge amount here. I'm the exec sponsor for the Disability Equality Network. Um, Gillian is one of our new co-chairs on Disability Equality Network and, and doing an absolutely fantastic job. It's a really vibrant community. Um, it's supporting uh, disabled colleagues across the whole organisation um, and their focus is on uh, not only supporting colleagues but also uh, making demonstrable improvements on how we can make CQC a great place to work and, and a great place for us to recruit and attract um, great talent as well, um, and there's some you know some really wonderful work going on this year, uh, looking at uh, how we can deliver innovations to you know, radically improve things like reasonable adjustments for disabled colleagues, um, and that's a collaboration across the whole organisation. So it's not just disability equality network; it's people from the people um, area and and technology colleagues as well. And I just wanted to echo the the, the uh, positivity around the, the the people pulse survey. Really looking to see the results of that because that's really focused around diversity, diversity and inclusion and there's some specific work in there that's looking at trying to delve deeper and understand what colleagues need um, to help support them make this a great place to work particularly particularly disabled colleagues so really looking forward to that um, and, the, and the wider improvement work. Thanks Mark. So a uh, number of hands going up fairly quickly. Actually Gillian I'll let you have first go as a member of the staff and then I think Stephen and David I saw and anyone else I've missed after that. Oh, oh sorry and Ali as well. Thanks Ian. Um, I guess there was kind of a kind of reflection and then um, from kind of my experience and then a couple of questions if that's all right. Um, just to say um, kind of Kate talked about the workshop um, on looking at recruitment. I just wanted to say that we were involved in that. Um, what, how that worked was that we were given kind of a que set of questions that we went out to our, all our networks with, which kind of asked them kind of what their perspective on how recruitment currently works. And then we brought that together into kind of a, a workshop across all of the networks, along with our diversity and inclusion colleagues and um, our recruitment colleagues. And I think what we've done there is a really solid piece of discovery. I think we're now going to be moving on to the kind of next stages of um, identifying kind of the best practice and the solutions, but I think it's a really positive start. So I just wanted to kind of um, kind of note that that's a really kind of good thing from the perspective of our quality networks. Um, in terms of just a couple of questions, Kate, um, you talk about the kind of 4.7% gap. Um, I, I guess I was interested in kind of what further work you're kind of in plan or is planned to kind of reduce that gap or and also um for the, that's in terms of disability and also kind of just in terms of understanding about variation across grades and how we kind of help to reduce that variation as well so that's kind of the first thing and then the second thing was just in terms of it talked about kind of tailored adjustment um agreements and I know from kind of our colleagues, kind of they really welcome having tailored adjustment agreements. But what happens is that as they move around the organisation, they feel like they have to kind of redo those tailored adjustment agreements every time they get a new line manager, and that can become really distressing. I know that in um, operations that there was kind of the Stay Well at Work initiative, and I just wondered, is there is there options and work going to be done to kind of ensure that that kind of that experience of of having to kind of reset. Um, adjustments um, with every manager is something that all colleagues no longer have to face. Thank you, Dylan. If, if I so thank you so much for the feedback on the workshop. Um, and as ev as ever, we started well, but the proof will be in the pudding. Um, so we need to keep up um, that following on from the discovery that needs to lead to ta tangible, uh, tangibly different ways of doing things. If I start and then maybe hand over to Mark. So I think there is something about increasing reporting. Um, and Mark uh, has been involved uh, around count me in and really trying to encourage colleagues to uh, disclose uh, to put uh, share their information um, around whether they have a, a disability your other protected characteristics. I think there's something about, um, you know, it would be really good to, for our, our stats to accurately reflect the colleagues that we have in the organisation. 
the variation across grade. Um, so that that is something, again, if there is an, an appetite for it, we can get into, into these reports going forward because there has been a, a, a notable increase in bringing colleagues into the organisation from um, different backgrounds. Um, but uh, we need to see that at every level of the organisation and the the data will show uh, where we are with that. I mean, this initiative such as the Inclusive Leadership Programme is uh, is about working with colleagues to actually see the outcomes of seeing them being promoted up through the organisation. And certainly I'm matched with a colleague who's um, recently been promoted to a kind of grade A level, so they're now at the manager level, and then successors, let, let's get them up into that, the, that kind of head of um, level as well. So that's something we're doing on that front. Um, and then on the reasonable adjustments and the lots of conversations, so I may not use the time right, but there's been a load of work around kind of passports, you know, so the idea that you don't just have a conversation about what keeps you well at work if you've got additional needs. You know, part of having healthy, good conversations as a line manager with your direct report is what you need to keep well at work. You know, what does your work routine look like? What are the, you know, what do you need in terms of support, et cetera? And, and I've got a real aspiration that we move to a point that everyone in the organisation has their own kind of wellness passport so that it's not unique for colleagues who have um, additional uh, requirements it's just how we we um, do business but if I could just pause and just check with Mark whether there's anything you'd add, you'd add or anything that I've not stated correctly yeah thank you so I think two things for me to supplement that one is there is a specific piece of work as part of our workforce disability quality standard improvements around recruitment for disabled colleagues um, there's specific we, we are seeing uh, once people apply uh, an, an, an effective success rate but we're not seeing enough applications, so I think we need to do more to publicise um, and and more in terms of our recruitment, specifically in those in those areas. I agree around the inclusive leadership pathway. I think that would be a good start. We need to see that expand and be more successful. Um, I do. I, I I think the passport um, concept is 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 really interesting, and that's part of a reasonable adjustments process that that works really well. I mean, I'm I'm leading on the. Um, the reasonable adjustments work with uh, uh, very, very closely with Jackie, who's our people director. Um, and what I'd really like to see is quite a radical uh, uh, approach to us um, improving radical adjustments, uh, re reasonable adjustments. Maybe we should call them radical adjustments. Um, uh, the, the quote I really like. So one of one of our um, disability equality network co-chairs uh, describes this. Uh, that the change that we want to see is. I want to see uh, applying for a, a reasonable adjustment as 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 easy as it is for me currently to order a printer cartridge on the on the tech portal. And I think that's a lovely way of describing it. And we want to make it as easy and simple for for colleagues to get the support that they need in the organisation and to understand what support is available as well. So I think that's a, a two pronged thing. So we will we will do that uh, this year. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Now, I. I can we go, um, Stephen, David, and Ali, which is the order I saw the hands, and I've obviously got to add Christine now as well, so let's take it in that order. Kate, thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> I mean, I, I very much welcome this because I think it was at a recent meeting of this board in the light of the LLRC report that we said we really, really need just greater visibility of, of people um, in in these these board discussions and I think you've delivered in this report really well on that so so I'd just like to say thank you I think this is a uh, this is a good follow-up uh, to some of the discussion we had and a point you do make in the paper going forward getting regular reports it will be really important to balance the the metrics and the demographics that are represented well here with the sentiment, the mood, and the morale, which we don't yet have because we didn't, haven't done the main survey and we don't, haven't yet been able to analyse the Pulse survey, but uh, in future reporting, making sure that we've got full visibility of those issues around sort of morale, engagement, sentiment, I think will be really important and, and very welcome. Thank you. Kate, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, two points I wanted to make. The first was a context point, and the second was a content point. And it was to look at the, I think it's important in this, that we look at the future of work from, to include an, an AI content and the context in which future of work will be developed. We could be leaders in that field, in my view. So that was my context point, if I may. The content point 
was really specifically one about job sharing, which uh, again is something I think that, that perhaps could be developed very considerably. And in that, uh, some of the experience that I've had has been unusual job sharing from the standard 50-50 kind of job sharing, particularly uh, putting together a very experienced and a less experienced person in that job sharing, which I've seldom seen done, unequal in the sense of not being 50-50 in terms of time, but being different to that, and finally, a job sharing that uh, takes positive account of one or the other, or indeed both participants' disabilities or other protected characteristics. I think job sharing gives an opportunity to move ahead more quickly uh, on that than just the normal uh, job recruitment and indeed the retention things that are put in place for that. Thank you. Um, so again, that's not data that I've shared with you before. I would need to check that I could get that data. But I think the starting point is, for me, would be how much job sharing do we have in the organisation? I know we've got a relatively senior arrangement um, in, in Mark's area of the business that's quite a new arrangement, maybe about six months old. Um, not that long ago, I was having a conversation, I think, with the Gender Equality Network about what would it look like if on our job adverts we said job share welcome? You know, what, what if we just said we're, we're an organisation that would be friendly or receptive to job sharing rather than it being on the individual to you kind of put forward that request not knowing where it would land? So I think it is an area we haven't massively focused on on to now um, but I, I'm more than happy to take away an action that says if we're already capturing that data let's share it with you if we're not let's start capturing it and then let's fold into the conversations we're having around recruitment with our equality networks around what would it look like if we more positively pro and proactively stated we would be uh, we would be really receptive to job shares because ultimately in, where, from my perspective of it you're getting kind of two brains for the you know two different perspectives two brains for the, the price of one so um, so I think that's an area we haven't really explored fully in we could do. Quick response if I, I may. I, I think the other thing is, of course, it, it opens up the opportunity of a kind of mentorship relationship to some extent, which is often very valuable. Thank you. I, 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 I'd like to come back on, the, on both those points, actually. So uh, job sharing, I see, so, so I like that innovation that you just described there, and I think that's something we should explore, but I do think um, in, in our world of technology and data and insight, it, recruitment and retention is a, is, is a challenge. It's a, it's a hot market out there. So uh, whatever approaches that we can take that uh, engender some in innovation and, and create a great place to work for colleagues is a, is a really positive thing. And we've had some success with um, some working through some job share for some uh, experiences for some for some very senior roles, and that's enabled us to to get access to great talent that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to get access to. So I think I think that's a really positive way forward. On AI, I think we've got a strong role to play here. Um, we've just delivered and are extending our enterprise data platform. Um, that's going to be used to um, support our single assessment framework and how we um, use data in a really uh, constructive way. Uh, to generate superb insights that support our, uh, our assessment of risk and our assessment of opportunity and how, how we structure and manage our work. Um, it will also be an opportunity to use large volumes of data to, um, to, 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 be, to be very constructive and, and I think um, allow us to innovate in ways that we haven't been able to before. I think we've got another role to play in terms of supporting the effective use of AI out there in the wider provider community because I can see um, innovation in AI when used safely um, and managed well is going to be one of the ways in which providers are able to um, meet uh, uh, overwhelming demand with, with, with scarce resources. So I think we've got, we've got a dual role to play there with uh, emerging AI technology. Thanks. Um, so Ali, I think come to you next, now, Christine. Thank you. Uh, Kate, as others have said, this is a really helpful report and um, really presents a lot of information well. You asked what other kind of information might be helpful as we evolve and continue to develop this report. Three brief ideas. Firstly, AI, not just in terms of our regulatory work, but actually in terms of how that's evolving and shaping the workforce over the short to midterm, recognizing that it's um, providing new ways of helping make people more efficient, more effective, but has to be... Um, taken with the right governance and guardrails around as it continues. Um, there are other areas in which we could potentially 
take employee sentiment as well, colleague sentiment as well, so however we do that would be helpful. And um, finally, whatever we can do to, I suppose, benchmark some far metrics against other organizations while recognizing that we are quite a special organization and uh, there probably aren't many around like us would be helpful. Thank you. Christy? Thanks. Um, yeah, I was interested in the um, pulse uh, response rate around um, it being safe to challenge the way things are done. And I just wondered if you could say something about that metric, that it's up 7% to 36% positive, and what under, underpins that? Um, thank you. So we will we will definitely get into this more when we have the full pulse survey in September. But also um, the the review we did, our listening, learning, and responding to concerns review, um, highlighted there was a, a kind of whole chapter around how we had um, disinvested in our speak up arrangements as an organisation, um, that we didn't have enough speak up guardians, that, that there was a lot lot more we needed to do to um, uh, support colleagues to feel comfortable speaking up and to feel confident something would be done in response to that. Um, again, there'll, there'll be a specific speak up um, item, an update coming to, to a future board. Um, I think it's positive that it's an increase. It's still far lower than we would want it to be. I mean, in an ideal world, you'd almost want all of your, in an ideal world, you want all of your people saying that they feel um, safe to speak up around here. So it's, uh, it, you know, little, little green shoots, but but a whole lot more work to do, and, and a lot of work is underway that, that Mark's um, leading as well. What's also important about this poll survey, Christine, when we get into it, is we will uh, be able to see it's, does it feel easier to speak up as a white colleague versus a colleague from an ethnic background or a disabled colleague or a colleague with, with a number of protected characteristics? So um, so we, will, we, we ask this question often, but this particular poll survey will enable us to look at it through the lens of does it feel even harder if you have um, different characteristics as well? But Mark, do you want to come in? Yeah, I think just to supplement that, I think... Um, I think we need to know a bit more. So I think what we'll be doing, um, in fact, we've we've spent a bit of time recently with the National Guardians Office, um, taking some advice from them on how we how we can approach evaluating what our freedom to speak up current capability is, and and what what would we put in place to to to, to develop a, a best 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 in class um, freedom to speak up service. I think the post survey also. Ha as well as diversity and inclusion, has got some, uh, hopefully, some interesting um, qualitative information that will enable us to understand a bit more about how people feel in the organisation about that. And we're going to go out with some specific engagement in the organisation to really kind of tap into and understand how how people are feeling. And and when we when we when we devise our plan about how we're going to uh, engage with the organisation and and make improvements, we'll. We'll, we'll make sure we properly engage and, uh, and get feedback from everybody on that. Thanks. I'll try to summarise for the moment if I can, but, but any other questions or comments? Okay, well, uh, firstly, thanks very much indeed, um, Kate, as everyone said, but I did um, clearly, uh, as, as Stephen said, your response to a number of questions on the board and the very fact that we've had so much discussion you know, way over the time allotted, I think shows the you know, absolutely right interest for, for the board. Um, should have been right anyway, and, and we've, I think, learned from some other events. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, the sort of questions you've addressed to us on content, I think what I've heard is, is come a long way, but like the format of what's there. Uh, not asking you to, and, and I would say actually it's not a bad template for some other changes as well, just, just more widely, in terms of its sort of length and clarity and telling us on plan on the page, you know, information on the page, it's actually quite a good template we might consider using elsewhere. Just coming back to this one, um, I haven't heard any um, specific requests of things we know we have, but there are one or two things you need to see, like job share, whether we have it, and, and you obviously absolutely the right response. If, if we've got it, we'll share it. If we haven't got it, we'll see if we can get it. For, for some good reasons, it's not just a, a trivial point, but an important issue. Um, <clears throat> um, and then I think both David and Ali have made some observations of things we might consider. I don't think it's a die for we must have it now, but things we might consider as part of a gradual process of, of improvement. Is that fair, David and, and Ali? Um, and then the other question you addressed or, or asked to consider is, is the timing of this. So, you know, this has got to be relevant to the board, but not overduly burdensome to the management. So, so what do you think? 
Yeah, so can I make a bid for three times a year? I think twice a year doesn't feel enough. And note your point that quarterly wouldn't wouldn't work. So if we could go for three times a year, but obviously dotted between that will be a conversation about the Pulse survey. Will an up, will be an update on the listening, learning, and responding to concerns review. So I think if we if we're getting our balance right, every board should have a people component. But the full suite of information, maybe we go for three times a year. And if I may just finally say, I'm here uh, representing this paper, but obviously Jackie Jackson and all of her team are the people who wrote it and put the content in. So thank you all for the positive feedback, and I'll pass that directly back onto the team as well. Okay, well, that, that's fine. Every other meeting will capture that as a sort of a standing item. I mean, I, I perhaps slightly glossed over one other point Steve made absolutely rightly. This is great hard fact, but the other thing is they need the sentiment of that. And I think whether that's formal or whether that's a golden thread through all of the, the reporting, you know, we, we can see. But it, it is an important point to make. But thank you very much, and thanks for passing the comments back. Um, we've uh, got a couple of um, uh, more formal matters now. Um, <coughs> people will know that we have some important uh, board committees, uh, one of which is the Audit and Risk Assurance Committee. So as we saw earlier, joined by Jeremy Boss, who's uh, the, the sort of acting or interim uh, chair of that committee. Um, uh, so Jeremy, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Um, I think in the first instance, we've got a, uh, a more formal report uh, We've read it, uh, but there may be some points you want to highlight, and then we'll take any comments. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think it's worth just giving a little bit of context to the first and longer report, which is the annual report from the Audit Risk Assurance Committee, and it's tailored to uh, support the accounting officer and the board, in particular in relation to the annual sign-off of the annual report and accounts, so it specifically relates to the year 22-23, i.e. the year ending on the 31st of March uh, 2023. Um, uh, and it's intended to demonstrate the committee has discharged all its duties in order to give the board and the accounting officer assurance about governance, risk and financial controls uh, within the CQC. I will start with external audit and the first thing is uh, there is some sort of good news, well good and bad news. So the good news is that our accounts for 2021-22 were laid before Parliament yesterday. Um, this has turned into somewhat of a marathon rather than a mid-tier mid, mid uh, run. Um, and unfortunately, that's largely caused by things outside the CQC's control. And, uh, and it's all driven by local uh, government pension schemes, uh, which really are very large numbers in our balance sheet, but historically, um, uh, they're uh, historic matters, and we are underwritten by the department for any impact of that. So actually, it doesn't change our performance very much, but it can change the accounts. And the NAO were unable to complete that work until <coughs> we'd received all the information from the local government pension scheme auditors. Um, so we now have that and that's now done, but we are a bit out of sync. Yeah, we're quite a lot way out of sync, because normally we'd be expecting to do our accounts about this time of the year, so it's a year later. Um, there is work at national level to try and minimise these delays for future years, although I have to say none of us are very confident that will make much difference. So we are in a situation where um, uh, external audit reports will be formally laid sometime after the year end, which is not ideal uh, for, for transparency purposes, um, but is the reality given uh, these uh, wider sector delays which impact on a number of organisations as well as ourselves. Um, but the good news is the NEO have issued an unqualified audit opinion. Um, uh, so, so that is, uh, gives us some assurance. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that they have already started work on this year, um, uh, but we've purposely delayed it slightly because we know we can't complete the work in the same time scale. So uh, we're doing it in the most efficient way we can rather than trying to revisit things. Um, alongside um, external audit, the other main, or one of the other main sources of assurance is internal audit and our inter internal audit program. And again, um, we have a, um, an assurance um, and uh, opinion from our internal auditor, uh, which is that uh, we are substantially um, uh, under control. That doesn't mean there aren't things we need to do. There always are more things we can do. Um, but, but again, that is good news, and the audit program was completed. We do get some other assurances more from internal uh, processes and committees around risk management, um, uh, fraud, and in particular our transformation program, uh, and then finally cyber security and information security incidents. Um, and it is worth noting that those uh, assurances have been provided. Uh, there are no significant matters I need to, to draw to, uh, uh, to the accounting officer or the board's 
um, uh, attention, um, uh, and the more detail is in the report. So I will leave that for questions if people want to raise them. Um, so the conclusion is that um, whilst there are some improvements, uh, which you always expect, actually, in fact, I'd be rather worried if we didn't find anything in our audit programmes, or very worried. Um, uh, so there are things we need to do, things we need to improve, um, but we are content that the governance and control process continue to be effective and that assurances provided are sufficiently reliable and comprehensive to meet the needs of the board and the accounting officer. I shall pause at that point for any questions. Questions, anyone? Seem pretty comprehensive to me, Jeremy. Um, I, I think we should just give a bit of credit to um, uh, those, uh, a wide number of people across uh, the organisation, but in particular in, in finance around getting through those accounts. So it has been a bit of a marathon. It has required us to, to go back over several things several times, which is never helpful, and also indeed our, our auditors for um, doing the best they can to try and make that process smooth as possible. Any questions or comments? Uh, anything else you want to add, Jeremy, from uh, the conduct of the ARAC more generally? That was a very formal report on last year. Anything else to add? Um, so in, in June, um, we considered a number of issues, none of which are um, likely to drive any particular things I need to draw attention to the board. It was noted that we have had our financial settlements, um, which is helpful from the Department for Grant and Aid. Um, uh, as I said, we, are, we have set an, a new internal audit programme, uh, we were a bit behind most of last year with our internal audit programme, which was not ideal, um, but we have done some work to bring that forward, so the work has started earlier, and we did indeed receive three reports in the first meeting, um, uh, one of which was low risk, two of which were medium risk, which means there are some things and recommendations we need to do, um, but again, nothing dramatic to uh, report to the board. Okay. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much indeed, Jeremy, and thank you for standing in on this role as well. Um, and uh, you will be doing that for a little while, just for the avoidance of doubt. Uh, uh, advertisements for a full-time replacement were um, undertaken a few weeks ago. Uh, the time period is now closed, so the next stage is uh, for the department and ministers to work out interviews, conduct interviews, which is likely to be after the summer because of the intervention of recess and appointments will follow. So um, the timing is not within our control, but I would estimate that it's probably going to be later this year, uh, the back end of the year, uh, not before. Um, then the other thing, another important committee, less this is unique to uh, <coughs> CQC, but is the Regulatory Governance Committee, um, does fulfill a very valuable function, and it's kind of been getting up and running in the last few months, I think, finding its feet and doing it very successfully. But Mark, um, do you want to uh, just give us some comments about the recent meeting and what you're, you're dealing with? I'm very happy to do that, Chairman. Thank you. And, and for those on joining the meeting who are n new to this, um, the, the, the RGC, yes, is, is unique to our organization. It focuses on assurance in relation to the policy and methodology of our, of how we regulate. Um, so we look at design, are we optimized to deliver on what's required of us as a regulator? We look at um, proactive improvements and improvements that we're making in response to uh, developments. Um, we look at the operational measures of how well we are actually managing to um, deliver on that design are we operationalizing what what we um, what we set out to do and then we look at um, sources of insight um, from our stakeholders as to whether um, we're proving to be effective is this delivering what what we what we intended um, and we we also um, conduct a series of deep dives on areas that uh, in an ideal world, we'd probably like to do it board, but there, there is the, the board agenda does not does not accommodate that. So we had a, a meeting a couple of weeks ago. Um, things that of interest that 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 came up as we went through it. We got an update on um, proposals for a, um, a a more structured and evidence based um, methodology for mental um, health inspections with, with, with more focus on 
<clears throat> a more structured focus on observation and understanding cultures. Um, I, I th it's going to involve greater input from, from staff, greater input from patients, and greater input from experts by experience. And I think that, you know, the, the early signs from the, from the pilot work are showing um, encouraging results, and the learnings from that <clears throat> will be uh, widely shared across, uh, across our, the, our, our, our porf portfolio. Um, so that's, that was very encouraging to, to hear about. It segued into a discussion about <clears throat> our, uh, our single assessment framework, and we had a discussion which we will um, most definitely come back to about how we how we balance the um, you know the desire for greater consistency in terms of our approach to regulation with the absolute necessity of um, retaining um, uh, and the application of professional judgment in in what we do. If something doesn't feel right, it isn't right, and the best people to um, assess whether um, something is right or not are uh, the experienced clinicians that we that we use um, uh, and the experienced inspectors that we use um, to, to, to do to do our work um, we have we got an update on you know good progress in relation to moving um, towards a, an increase in our Capability to do, you know, genuine out of hours inspections, that, um, inspections um, that are that are that are not um, uh, intended to take place during regular office hours. That's an important part of our capability, and and we're we're, we're going to grow that. Another part of our toolkit that we talked about. Uh, um, Potentially exercising some of our powers under the Regulation and Invest Investigatory Powers Act um, in, in relation, to, which relate to covert surveillance. Um, we're, we're happy with the plans in relation to that. We're happy with the controls that have been put in place in relation to that, and we should be ready to um, start a a. a Pilot, which will be largely at this stage around open source information, but uh, start a pilot later in the year. I think you know having this capability as part of our toolkit um, has ought to have an important deterrent um, uh, aspect as well as um, uh, allowing us to target potential abuse where where we become a, a, aware of it or we have suspicions around it. Um, one of the things that had, that, that we've you know we're pleased that as we now have a, a a much better view of is it's really important that we <clears throat> that we quickly update the public in relation to um, uh, concerns that we've that that we identify so you know our reports need to get out in a timely way uh, we've had a good look at the tail you know the averages have been coming down. But it's variance that was concerning us, and we've had a good look at the tail, and actually, um, uh, that's pretty clean. Um, so there's been very good work to to uh, to, to to work through that. Uh, another thing in our toolkit, um, which uh, as, as a committee we've encouraged the organisation to use more <clears throat> uh, more proactively, has been our ability to suspend the rating of a provider. We have used it um, on, a, on a relatively small number of occasions. I think it's important that we do do that when we have, um, uh, uh, when we come across information that, that warrants it. And um, so now we have, I think, uh, you know, that encouragement is, is, is reinforced by empowerment at the right level in the organization encouraging people to uh, have the confidence to do that when the um, when the circumstances uh, warrant it um, in terms of external engagement I think one of the very encouraging things that that we heard about was evidence of very good levels of awareness and understanding um, amongst those we 
regulate in relation to our, our plans for our future regulatory model. The scores are, are, are really very good and it, and it reflects well on a huge effort to engage proactively with providers about <coughs> what is coming. So the team are to be comm commended in relation to that. Um, we're also going to use the RGC as the sort of collating ground for a large number of recommendations for improvement for the organization that come in from, from a range of sources. We have, I think, 211 uh, on our list. We haven't seen the, we haven't seen the full list yet. Uh, that will probably um, be for a future meeting, but we want to try and track this from uh, two or three angles. We want, to, we, we want to do it from an audit action, you know, of the things that we agree to improve actually getting done on time. We, we want to look at it at a qualitative perspective. What have we learned? What insights have other people had that we hadn't really realized ourselves? Um, and, we, and we also certainly want to have a look at the recommendations that have not been accepted. Why, have, why, have, you know, why do we think um, other people's uh, insights and views were, were, were not right? Um, and then our deep dive this time was, was, was in, in relation to complaints, uh, and we also looked at our ratings um, re review process, which is a sort of particular type of complaint. Um, complaints are uh, tremendous learning experiences, uh, as uh, you know, as um, as I've said before. You know, we, you learn more falling off a ladder than you do when. Um, climbing up and down it a hundred times, uh, and so when things go wrong, when a, when there is a either a partial or fully finding a fault against the organisation, it's a great opportunity for us to learn. Um, and one of the things that we talked about at the committee was, you know, how joined up we are, where we're seeing repeat failings. You know, the, we want to make sure the lessons are not just local; that we're learning across the organisation, and we're joining up insights which could be for improvement, which which could be applied elsewhere. So it was a good meeting, um, and uh, at our next meeting, we're 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 probably going to spend some time um, looking at what we're talking about, seeing the silent services, where where we're not getting. Um, where, where we're not getting a lot of feedback in relation to a, to a service and perhaps sectors where we have fewer triangulation points in relation to other sources of insight into a, a provider, how are we assessing risk in relation to those services? That will be for next time. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Mark. It's a bit busy agenda and uh, probably requires a bit more explanation, but the, the ARAC agenda is to some extent relatively similar between organisations. This is, is unique to us. Uh, I'll just ask questions in a moment, just to pick up on one point you mentioned about the, you know, the external recommendations and things to look at, and those who are not implementing, I think, probably just worth highlighting, or at least I'll stand to be corrected, but based on what I've seen, quite a few of them, the answer is quite simple, that people have considered we might like to do something, but it's not within our powers. So <clears throat> it's not something that we're refusing to do. It's just that you know, um, a government would need to decide if they wanted yeah. to extend our powers. So um, there's probably quite a big chunk of that third category, I think, isn't it? Um, any questions uh, or comments for uh, Mark? No? I, well, I think there's an open invitation. Although he's got a busy agenda, an open invitation. If there's things that the committee thinks ought to be dealt with within the terms of reference, uh, then, then please do uh, let Mark and me know and we'll, we'll work it out on the template. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mark. Um, just a few final things. Um, the only item we had for approval on the agenda today, slightly unusual, was the minutes of the last meeting that was circulated before. I won't ask those who weren't here to comment, but for everyone else, are you happy that it's a fair record of the meeting? My colleagues, yes, seem to be, so uh, we'll approve those. Um, uh, the, there were no outstanding actions on the action log, so there's nothing to mention there. So in terms of the formal meeting, it brings us to any other business. I have one I want to deal with. Before I deal with that, can I just look around the room and see if anybody else wants to raise anything? Okay. Um, <clears throat> just what I wanted to deal with, and apologies, um, I couldn't get a paper in, in the pack, but uh, uh, time didn't allow it. Uh, but <clears throat> we have um, three committees of this board. The, to the Ramco membership is, is determined by our regulations, uh, but the other two, it, it, they do important work for the board, but I think it's the, up to the board to make sure it's happy with the people on those committees. Um, 
and we've just had reports from the, the, the two chairs. Um, obviously, we've been running very light on non-executive directors for the last six or nine months, but we'd like to take the opportunity of uh, uh, bolstering the, the main committees with the changes. So um, although it wasn't in the public papers, I have spoken to colleagues outside the room, but this is a request for approval uh, for two um, additions. Um, one is that Christine should join the Regulatory Governance Committee. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. And the other is that Mark Chakravarti would join the Audit and Risk Committee. Um, there is a slight complication on the latter in that, uh, having had a quick look at the dates, he may have problems attending some in the, the near future. So what I would ask for two approvals, um, one is that Christine joins <coughs> the RGC with immediate effect, and the other is that Mark joins the ARAC but add a date to be determined when we can clarify his availability. It wouldn't be fair to ask him to be a member when he can't turn up for any meetings. So can I have my board colleagues' approval for those? Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I think on that, um, we will uh, close the meeting officially. So uh, thank you to my board colleagues here, and thank you very much to uh, those listening in. However, regular observers or listeners will know also we do... Um, say if people would like to submit questions, uh, we'll happily submit them to the board. Uh, we have to do that in advance, given the fact that uh, this is live streamed, but, but we don't have uh, others in the room. So I do have um, some questions to address. Um, I think they're all for Mr. Robin Pike. Um, so the three, so I'll take them in, in turns. Uh, the first is how can CQC improve its service to whistleblowers? Uh, Mark, it might be best if I ask you to pick that up first. Thank you. Um, so uh, we are committed to effectively handling concerns from workers of providers registered with CQC, uh, including when they make protected disclosures uh, or whistleblowing. Um, we looked again at our current practices uh, during the listening, learning and responding to concerns review, which was published uh, in March earlier this year. This review identified opportunities for improvement and we have agreed action plan that is underway now. These include the implementation of new technology that supports the improvement in collecting and monitoring concerns that are raised with us. And you mentioned Ian, Ian earlier about the successful release that we had yesterday. That was our, our contact service as part of our regulatory platform, which is the foundation of how we can start to improve that, that monitoring. Um, and particularly wanted to thank again operational colleagues, national um, customer call centre, service centre colleagues um, and our technology colleagues as well for, for, for a fantastic um, uh, start of that, that, that technology rollout. Um, we're also making improvements in how we collect equality data uh, and improvements in our standard operating procedures and, and, and training and support to colleagues to help uh, continuously improve our service. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Um, as you say, fundamentally important part of what we do. Uh, Sean, I think the, this one's probably for you. Um, how does CQC decide when to inspect independent hospitals, and particularly those that are newly opened? Uh, thanks very much. Uh, <clears throat> um, well, it, our inspection process really begins with uh, the registration of, of all providers. And uh, when pr new providers register with us, they, we, we undertake a very robust and thorough assessment of, uh, of their quality. Um, once that has been completed, we we continuously monitor the performance of, of providers with um, data that we receive, information we receive, feedback we receive from 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 patients, from staff, and and um, hard data we, we can obtain uh, for for that provider's performance. And from that through that process, we develop a, a picture of risk. For that organisation, and we can choose to inspect when we think that the the risk, you know, warrants that inspection. So the answer really is, we um, we we choose when we inspect uh, providers based on the picture of risk that we've built up <clears throat> through the data and intelligence processes that we operate. Thanks, uh, and it's uh, probably worth saying that one of the things that. Uh, Mark's RGC has been doing is looking at uh, ratings from first inspections from newly approved bodies. That's not just uh, independent hospitals, but it, it's something we do generally. And, and protections from whistleblowers as well is on yeah. our list. Um, and then last question, actually, Sean, looks like another one for you as well. Um, 
What process does the CQC have for reviewing and improving its inspections of dental practices? Um, th there's a, a inference in there improving. Um, I don't know if that means continuous improvement, other things, but um, perhaps you could answer as, uh, from your perspective. So what processes do we have for reviewing and improving inspections of dental practices? Uh, others can add if they wish. I think the, the, the first thing to say probably is that <clears throat> we do a lot of these uh, inspections. Uh, in the last financial year, we've done over a 1,000 uh, 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 inspections of dental practices alongside over 600 um, uh, monitoring calls. So we do a lot of them. Um, uh, we, we, we also frequently review uh, the processes we operate uh, and ensure that we are using the feedback we've received from uh, providers in um, ensuring that we are doing things like reducing the burden of of inspection, making sure that our um, our, our our reports are uh, uh, accurate and well written. Um, we've just recently completed a review of assessment reports and templates that are used in these inspections. Uh, again, in 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 a, in a in the in a way of responding to feedback we've had. So essentially, they are under continuous review. <clears throat> and we operate a lot of them, so we get plenty of feedback and plenty of opportunity to make sure that uh, the, the inspection processes are uh, responding to the feedback we've, we've received. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, colleagues need to add. I think that brings us to the end of the question, so thank you, Mr. Pike. I hope uh, you found those responses helpful. Uh, so, uh, end of meeting, end of questions. Uh, thank you to my colleagues for joining us here today. Uh, we'll meeting again in a couple of months. For those listening, thank you very much for joining us.